Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Cinematic Excrement. Today, we continue our look at the history of the Fantastic Four on film. In case you missed it, last time we looked at the 1994 movie produced by Roger Corman and Bernd Eichinger. It was made on the cheap as a way for Eichinger to retain the film rights to the Fantastic Four for as little money as possible, and it shows. But the movie does have a certain campy charm to it. It was never officially released, and whether or not the movie was ever intended to see the light of day is a matter of some debate, but its production ultimately afforded Eichinger the opportunity to work with 20th Century Fox on the big-budget adaptation of Marvel's first family that he wanted to make in the first place. They started work on the film the next year. Unfortunately, it was stuck in the dreaded development hell for quite some time. The script went through several rewrites due to budgetary concerns from Fox, and they had a revolving door of directors. Initially, Chris Columbus was supposed to direct, but he stepped back into a producer role and Peter Siegel took over. Then it was Sam Wiseman, and then Roger Gosnell, and Eichinger had to negotiate an extension with Marvel as the movie rights were about to expire. Again, then Gosnell decided he'd rather direct the Scooby-Doo movie, don't ask me why, so they brought in Peyton Reed, and this would not be the only time he replaced a director on a Marvel movie. Then he left due to creative differences with Fox, and ultimately they settled on Tim Story in 2004. Nine years after they started working on the damn thing. Supposedly he got the job because the powers that be at Fox were impressed with his work on the movie Taxi, starring Jimmy Fallon and Queen Latifah. I find that hard to believe, as I'm quite certain no one has ever been impressed by Taxi. Nevertheless, he got the job, and in 2005, we finally got our big-budget Fantastic Four movie, simply titled Fantastic Four. They could afford name actors, bigger sets, and better special effects, but not the word the in the title. Go figure. Anyway, the story is set up similar to the Roger Corman movie, though the setup is much faster. In fact, it's ridiculously fast. Within seven minutes, the movie introduces all of the major characters, their backstories, their occupations, and their connections to each other. It's fascinating. I have never seen a movie introduce its characters so quickly. Unfortunately, the introductions are a bit clunky. The expositional dialogue has quite a few as-you-know moments, where characters introduce themselves to the audience by reminding other characters about shit they already know. Anyway, Reed Richards and Ben Grimm, played by Yoan Gruffitt and Michael Chiklis respectively, have a plan to go into space to study some kind of glowing cloud. All hail. Which could potentially lead to great discoveries in the field of... uh... science. Unlike the Roger Corman movie, Reed and Ben do not have a seemingly unlimited source of funding. In fact, they're flat broke. Fortunately, Reed's obviously evil friend, Victor Von Doom, seriously, who are they kidding with this lighting, played by Julian McMahon, has a shitload of money and his own space station, and he's agreed to finance Reed's mission to space, as well as provide the services of his girlfriend and director of genetic research, Susan Storm, who apparently used to date Reed. And her brother Johnny Storm, played by a pre-Captain America Chris Evans, will serve as a pilot. Victor will also be joining them on the mission, and I really have no idea why. Sure, he's the CEO, and if he wants to go, they can't really stop him, but he's the CEO! He's not supposed to be doing the dirty work! For that matter, I really don't get why Johnny's going either. He apparently washed out of NASA, and he's the pilot for this mission, while Ben, the actual qualified pilot, is riding shotgun. Yeah, they're all gonna die. Well, they don't actually die, but they do get bombarded with cosmic radiation. Somehow they survive and make it back to Earth in a sequence that we don't actually see, but, well, you know what happens next. Reed gets all stretchy, Sue gets all fady, Johnny gets all flamey, and Ben gets all thingy. Wait. That came out wrong. And Victor gains some sort of electromagnetic powers, though he seems far more concerned with the fact that he's slowly losing his killer good looks. We need to keep this confidential. Your skin is slowly turning into metal. How do you propose to keep that confidential? There ain't enough makeup in the world to hide that. Things go from bad to worse for Mr. Von Doom as his board of directors is not happy with the failure of their rather expensive experiments, and he is eventually voted out of the company. This ultimately drives Victor into a murderous rage, and he takes his bloody revenge on his former colleagues and hold the phone. Is it me, or does this sound strangely familiar? Check this out. 
filthy rich guy in charge of a billion dollar company funds an experiment that goes horribly wrong and results in nasty physical and psychological changes. He is then forced out of the company by the board of directors, doesn't take it well, goes batshit, kills all of them, and starts wreaking havoc on New York City. Yeah, it's pretty much the same fucking story as the Green Goblin in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. Unbelievable! I can understand wanting to copy the success of Spider-Man, but that doesn't mean you should actually copy Spider-Man! While Victor is slowly descending into madness, our heroes are trying to find their own ways to cope with their newfound... gifts. And as you might expect, none of them have a harder time than the thing. Especially since he has a fiancé who is not terribly happy with his new look. Poor Ben does not take rejection well and goes for a mope on the Brooklyn Bridge and scares the ever-loving shit out of a suicidal man in the process. This leads to Ben saving the man's life, but he causes a multi-multi-multi-car pileup in the process. Well, you probably just killed about 20 people in that series of car accidents you just caused, but you saved that one guy, so... Congrats? At this point, the movie kinda goes off the rails. The other three members of the Fantastic Four are trying to get to Ben, but there's a shitload of cars and people in their way, so Reed comes up with a brilliant idea for Sue to turn invisible so she can slip through the crowd. But unlike the Roger Corman movie, her clothing does not turn invisible with her. So she's gotta get naked. What follows is, sadly, quite predictable. And this is the point where every teenage boy in the theater move their popcorn buckets into a strategic position. But eventually she gets her invisibility working again and slips through the crowd. And a moment later... Wait, what the hell? How did Reed and Johnny get up there? Why did they need her to strip down and go invisible if sneaking through the crowd was that easy? I still can't believe you made me do that. Neither can I. What was the fucking point? And then there's a huge explosion which threatens the lives of even more innocent bystanders, but our heroes quickly put their newfound powers to good use and save the day. But again, the day would not have needed saving if it wasn't for Ben. I know you guys are new at this, but your superhero act needs a bit of work. And after all this, Debbie still dumps Ben. Yeah, this is the moment where she chooses to throw down the engagement ring. She would then go on to hook up with some crazy guy with an eye patch, and it would not end well. You really should have stuck with Ben. Sure, he's a bit rough around the edges, in more ways than one, but at least he doesn't keep a collection of severed heads. Much like the Roger Corman film, The Thing is easily the best part of the movie. He has the biggest heart of anyone in the Fantastic Four, literally and figuratively, and he cares deeply for his friends, especially Reed, and will not hesitate to protect them from harm. Is there a problem? Because it's a quarter to clobbering but he struggles to deal with his radical transformation and has trouble finding his place in the world. You got no idea what I... what I'd give to be invisible. The only thing keeping him going is the hope that one day Reed will find a way to cure his condition and he'll be able to live a normal life. And sure enough, that day finally comes. But on that day, Victor goes full Doctor Doom and threatens to destroy the Fantastic Four and take over the world. Yeah, yeah. Realizing he needs the thing to stop Doom and save his friends, Ben finally comes to terms with who he is and who he has to be. And then... well... you know what time it is. It's clobbering time! <laughs> Michael Chiklis does a fantastic job with this role. Pun intended. Not only does he look the part, but he was a fan of the Fantastic Four comics growing up, and he really gets the character. His performance is outstanding, and you can tell he is loving every minute he gets to play the thing. Even though that rubber suit was horribly uncomfortable. And except for one or two brief moments, they did not put any digital enhancement into his voice. That's all him. Now if you're wondering, what happened to the thing's blind girlfriend? She is in the movie. Briefly. This time around, Alicia Masters is played by Kerry Washington, and sadly, she only shows up in two scenes. We see her when she first meets Ben in a bar, and then she's celebrating with him after they stop Doctor Doom. And that's it. Supposedly, they filmed more scenes that further developed the character and her relationship to the thing, and also alluded to her relationship with Fantastic Four villain the Puppet Master, but that footage ended up on the cutting room floor. It's really too bad because Carrie's a good actress and I wanted to see a new take on this character after the rather silly portrayal of Alicia in the Roger Corman movie. Ben, no! I love you. Ugh. 
As for the rest of our heroes, to say they are disappointing would be an understatement. Reed and Sue go back and forth between looking like they're about to rekindle their old romance and reminding each other why their romance ended in the first place. And it gets old pretty fast. It certainly doesn't help that Gruffin and Alba have no chemistry whatsoever, and some of their arguments are just ridiculous. It's been two years and all you can say is that you're happy for me and some other guy? How dare you try to be so nice and understanding? Why can't you be a jealous asshole like a normal guy? In fact, all of these characters do a considerable amount of arguing. And I know that's supposed to be part of their characterization. The Fantastic Four are a family, and like any family, they have their occasional squabbles. But the key word there is occasional. In this movie, that's almost all they do. They spend more time fighting each other than they do fighting Doctor Doom. Especially Johnny and Ben. Speaking of Johnny, he is insufferable. This character is a mess from the moment he first appears on screen. In his first shot, he's making out with some woman who is driving a convertible while he's riding a motorcycle next to her. First of all, why would you do that? Second, how are you doing that? Third, who the fuck is this woman? Don't ask me, we never see her again. Is this a woman he's never met until now? Does he normally drive up to random women on the highway and start sucking face? What the hell is going on here? And throughout the movie, he's constantly acting like a self-important jackass and spits out annoying quip after annoying quip and I just want to punch him in his stupid face! I don't think they could have made this character more annoying if they tried. Granted, he was occasionally a bit of a twit in the original comics, but that version of Johnny Storm was a teenager. In the movie, he's a grown-ass man, but he's still acting like a teenager. And I can't just blame Tim Story for this, because most of Chris's dialogue was improvised. So it's just as much his fault. Chris, you are the worst. Aww, oh, I can't stay mad at you. As for the story, I have to say it's pretty weak for a superhero movie. Not only do our heroes have a tendency to act kinda stupid, seriously, these people are scientists, how are they not able to tell Victor Von Doom is evil? But the superheroes spend remarkably little time acting like superheroes. This movie has two action sequences. Two. There's the one on the Brooklyn Bridge, which was basically just the four cleaning up their own mess, and then there's the final confrontation with Doom. And that's it! How do you make a superhero movie with so little action? I know it's an origin story and you need time to properly develop these characters and whatnot, but surely you could have found room for at least one more act of noble heroism in there somewhere. Don't do drugs. That doesn't count. And the action sequences are at least competently choreographed, but the effects have not aged well. Mr. Fantastic especially looks more like a cartoon at times than a real life human. Likewise for the Human Torch. Thank God they didn't try to make the thing CG. All in all, I wouldn't say I hate the movie. It's certainly not without its good points, but it's still a hot mess. And critics responded as you'd expect. Audiences, however, ate this thing up and it raked in over three times its production budget. And with a bona fide hit on their hands, Fox naturally greenlit a sequel. And thankfully, that film did not take 10 years to develop. In 2007, we got our second big-budget Fantastic Four movie, Rise of the Silver Surfer. This time around, we find Reed and Sue ready to tie the knot, and thank God Reed is not getting married in his Fantastic Four uniform. But the good times quickly turn bad with the arrival of the Silver Surfer, played by Doug Jones and voiced by Lawrence Fishburne, an extraterrestrial being who causes all kinds of problems for planet Earth, like making it snow in Egypt, freezing the Sea of Japan, drying up the Thames, and knocking out power to Los Angeles. Although it is California, so they probably would have had a blackout even if the server hadn't shown up. He also somehow revives Doctor Doom, and when the not-so-good Doctor confronts him, restores him to his normal human form. But oddly enough, the movie takes great pains to keep Doom's face concealed until his restoration, even after he removes his mask. Which makes no sense. Why would you have him take off the mask only to continue to keep his face obscured? The answer is Studio Mandate. Apparently, they really did not like Doom's makeup, so they ordered them to keep his face hidden as much as possible. Without being able to see the makeup clearly, I can't really tell if they made the right call or not, but either way, the concept of hiding an unmasked man's face is kinda silly. 
The military is naturally concerned with the appearance of the surfer and attempts to enlist the help of the Fantastic Four. But Reed initially blows them off because he is apparently too busy with his upcoming wedding. You see, I'm getting married this Saturday. But Mr. Richards, the fate of the planet is at stake. Don't care, getting hitched. But they have a change of heart after the surfer interrupts Reed and Sue's wedding. What a jerk. And has a brief skirmish with the Human Torch. During said skirmish, we learn the surfer can basically pass through any object without damaging it, and he somehow screws up the torch's powers, causing Johnny to swap powers with another member of the Fantastic Four when he touches them. And at this point, I'm starting to wonder what superpower the surfer is going to pull out of his silver ass next. I really do not like this type of character because it allows the writers to be lazy. There's never any clear explanation of what the surfer can and cannot do, so basically he's capable of doing whatever the plot calls for at any given time. I know, I know. It's magic. We don't have to explain it. And if that wasn't ridiculous enough for you, hang on, it gets worse. The military has also enlisted the help of the newly restored Victor Von Doom since he has intel from his encounter with the Surfer. This does not sit well with our heroes for reasons that are obvious to everyone but General Dumbass over here. You trust Victor and you're gonna regret it. So far the only one I've regretted trusting here is you. So you regret trusting the superheroes who perform good deeds on a daily basis and are actively working to help you save the planet but you're willing to trust the murderous psychopath. You're voting for Trump, aren't you? In any case, by pooling their resources, they managed to come up with a scientific doohickey that can separate the surfer from his board, since that's apparently the source of all his power. And it actually works. The guy has supreme control over all matter in the universe, but the power of science compels him. And this is the problem with not clearly defining his capabilities. He's had seemingly godlike powers up to this point, but this one device can stop him because reasons. Why is he vulnerable to that when seemingly nothing else can harm him? The answer is because shut up. With the surfer now powerless, he is taken to Siberia. Because where else are they going to take him? and the four are kept under lock and key while Doom is free to roam the facility unchecked. He's even granted permission to study the surfboard. Again, you're trusting the murderous psychopath over the superheroes. And you're giving him access to the most powerful weapon on the planet. You're so dumb, I doubt you can even spell general. Are we prisoners? How did that happen? You know you're in trouble when Johnny starts asking the important questions. Unbeknownst to the General, Doom has built himself a device that allows him to use the surfboard, because science, and as soon as they give him access, he kills them all. Gee, who could have seen that coming? General, have you never heard the fable of the farmer and the viper? You knew that motherfucker was a snake! While this is going on, Sue sneaks out of the holding cell, which is easy because, as we've established, the military in this movie is run by complete fuckwits, and she finally learns the surfer's story. His name is Norin Rad, and he was chosen as the herald of a mysterious being known as Galactus, the Devourer of Worlds. Norin's job is to find new planets for his master and prepare them for destruction, and his surfboard guides Galactus to the planet and he literally sucks the life out of it. In exchange, Galactus agrees to leave Norin's home planet alone. Okay, so all they have to do to avoid the destruction of Earth is get the board off the planet. Simple. Oh, wait. No. That would be the same board that they pretty much handed to Dr. Doom on a silver platter. So our heroes pile into their flying car. Yeah, they have one in this movie too, but unlike the Corman movie, at least they teased it ahead of time instead of it coming out of nowhere, and it gets some decent screen time. But they quickly find themselves outmatched by Doom's newfound powers, and Sue is fatally wounded by a silver spear intended for Norin. And I have no idea why she thought her shield would save her. She encountered the surfer once before, and it was made quite clear that her powers have no effect on him. Why did she think it would be different with Doom on the surfboard? And if she did think the shield would stop the spear, why not just project it around Norrin from a distance? She can do that! In a last-ditch effort, they let Johnny absorb all of their powers, turning him into the fantastic invisible torch thing, or something like that. And he soon beats Doom into submission and destroys his control device. And while this is admittedly a fun sequence, how does he still have his human torch powers? 
Every time he touched someone before, they swapped powers, so shouldn't that mean- You know what, fuck it, I don't care anymore. So Norin is the Silver Surfer once again, and it turns out he has resurrection powers too. Add it to the list. But it may be too late, as Galactus has come at last. And boy is it a disappointment. For those of you who may not know, this is what Galactus looked like in the comics. And this is what he looks like in the movie. A giant cloudy anus in space. And he, she, or it doesn't talk. There's no characterization here whatsoever. I don't expect an adaptation to be 100% faithful to the source material, and accept that some changes will be made. And if they wanted to modify Galactus' design, fine. His 1960s design is a bit goofy by today's standards after all. But this was the best they could come up with? And how do you suppose they stop the giant space anus from devouring the Earth? The surfer flies into it and suicide bombs it into oblivion. Hold the fucking phone. You had the power to destroy Galactus anytime you wanted, and yet you led it to several inhabited planets and allowed it to destroy countless innocent lives before a pretty blonde girl finally convinced you to sack up and fight back? You selfish dick waffle. Well, what more can I say about this movie? I suppose in some ways it's an improvement over its predecessor. Johnny isn't nearly as annoying this time around. The four spent much less time bickering with each other and actually felt more like a family. And I did like how they played up their celebrity status, something that makes them different from the average superhero. They don't hide behind masks and secret identities. They lead very public lives. The sequel was also a huge improvement in the action department. It's a superhero movie where the superheroes actually get to act like superheroes. Imagine that! And Chiklis is still pretty awesome as the thing, though he seems to have developed this weird fascination with the word crap. Ah, crap. Holy crap. Ah, crap. Why does he keep saying crap? Is that like his thing now? <laughs> thing. But it has its share of problems as well. The special effects are still pretty dated, although the Silver Surfer looks okay. The comedic moments are hit and miss, as is the acting. Jessica Alba's performance especially stands out, and not in a good way. Though for what it's worth, she blames director Tim Story for basically not allowing her to act. Allegedly, he once told Alba during a scene where she was supposed to cry, It looks too real. It looks too painful. Can you be prettier when you cry? Cry pretty, Jessica. Don't do that thing with your face. Just make it flat. We can CGI the tears in. Easy, stomach. Don't turn over now. Easy does it. And the number of stupid characters in this movie is far too high. You know the line in Spaceballs where Dark Helmet says evil will always triumph because good is dumb? This movie really takes that to heart. The only reason Doctor Doom is able to accomplish anything in this movie is because the good guy's stupidity allows him to. It's fascinating how much he is able to get away with simply because no one can be bothered to stop him. You know that gadget he built to control the Silver Surfboard? There's a moment where Sue walks in on him while he's building it, and he hastily throws a cloth over it and hopes she doesn't notice. And it works! Isn't she supposed to be a scientist? She was Victor's director of genetic research, though apparently not his director of noticing the fucking obvious. And I really do not like the Silver Surfer. The performance is fine, Jones and Fishburne did a decent job considering what they had to work with. Unfortunately, what they had to work with was kinda shit. Throughout the film, the Surfer constantly tells us he has no choice but to serve Galactus in order to protect his family and his homeworld. But then we find out he had the power to stop Galactus all the time if he was only willing to sacrifice himself. That would have saved his homeworld and many other worlds. But this wasn't an option, why? Oh, I had no choice, I had no choice. Bitch, you had a choice the whole time. He chose... poorly. This is not how the story played out in the comics, by the way. In that story, the Surfer wasn't conflicted at all about helping his master destroy the Earth. He simply didn't care. 
As far as he was concerned, the relatively primitive humans were so far beneath him and his master that their existence was insignificant, and Galactus destroying the planet was the equivalent of a man stepping on an anthill. But through a chance encounter with Alicia Masters, who senses an air of nobility beneath his callous exterior, she teaches him the value of pity and compassion, and he comes to realize the people of Earth have as much of a right to live as he. And with that, he turns on his former master and aids the Fantastic Four in their fight with Galactus. Why couldn't they have gone with this story, or at least something like it? I'd much rather have a villain who learns the value of life and redeems himself than a coward who allowed many innocent lives to be snuffed out because he just couldn't be bothered. And speaking of Alicia Masters, you might be wondering what happened to her. Well, she's still around, and she has quite a bit more screen time in this movie, but apart from a running gag where she can somehow always tell when Johnny enters the room, they don't give her much to do. Supposedly, there were plans to expand on the character and her relationship with Ben in the third movie, but that didn't happen because Rise of the Silver Surfer didn't exactly do well. It didn't exactly flop, mind you, it still made money, but it made less money than its predecessor and cost more to make. That's not the start of a good trend, and the powers that be at 20th Century Fox realize this and flip the reboot switch. Rise of the Silver Surfer may very well be the best Fantastic Four movie, but best is a relative term. Like the movie that came before it, I can't say I hate it, but I don't particularly like it either. It's an improvement in some areas, but a step backwards in others, and overall it's just not very good. And I can't say either of the Tim Story movies are good enough to warrant a recommendation. If you haven't seen them, you're not missing much. But we're not done yet. We still have one more movie to go. So join me next time when our fantastic journey comes to its not-so-fantastic conclusion. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. Sir. Um, I should be on that list. Name? Stanley. Yeah, uh, nice try, buddy. No, nice no, try. really, I'm nice Stanley. Yeah.